CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Bills Mafia, beware. It is a tricky time to be a Bills fan and a consumer of Bills content. It's a pretty difficult time to be somebody who produces it. Uh, I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with my co-host Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Uh, Thank you for joining Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. And Jonah, I, I want to get into uh, this coverage. Uh, maybe I should have an asterisk or use finger quotes on coverage of the Buffalo Bills lately. Uh, it's been a lot of, and it will continue to be, especially for the next month and a half while we enter this void of the Bills reporting. Uh, they don't uh, until the end of July at St. John Fisher for training camp. So the players are going to be off to their own devices and there won't be much opportunity for journalists to interview them or get many answers. So we're pretty much stuck on hold uh, in the information gathering business, uh, or at least in the traditional sense. Uh, nobody will be brought to a podium. There will be no news conferences. Maybe we catch up to somebody at a football camp, uh, at a youth camp, that is, not a training camp. But uh, this offseason has been frustrating. And uh, it's speculation, it's assumptions, it's stone guesses, reckless tea leaf reading and leaping to conclusions and everybody playing social media CSI to try to figure out who means this. And DeAndre Hopkins winked when he, uh, somebody mentioned Josh Allen's name and uh, he winced into the camera when somebody mentioned Mac Jones. And now here DeAndre Hopkins uh, has had uh, reportedly a great visit with the Patriots and with the Titans, two teams that don't seem to be Super Bowl favorites, but Jonah, I, and, and I'm, before I get on too much of a rant, I just, uh, it was all brought back to the fore at the beginning of the week with Stefan Diggs stuff. And today, former NFL general manager Mike Lombardi went on Pat McAfee's podcast and brought up Leslie Frazier in 13 seconds again and, and said that Sean McDermott uh, took away the play calling duties during that sequence against the Chiefs in the playoffs. And look, we've had DeAndre Hopkins and OBJ and Von Miller's cockamamie guarantees and Josh Allen's personal life and what should you report and what shouldn't you report and then Stefan Diggs and everybody trying to figure out what his latest Instagram uh, message even means these cryptic things that everybody's floating around nobody the word salad that Josh Allen had in his news conference on Tuesday where he said it's not football related and then the agent says it's not contract related and then everybody's guessing well what does that mean and who's telling the truth and Matt Ariza legal analysis that has been obtuse and misguided. And, and again, now we're back to Leslie Frazier, uh, who left the team back at the tr- at training camp, and people are guessing that. It is open season on Sean McDermott's Buffalo Bills, and everybody is looking for fire and smoke and how hot is the seat that Sean McDermott is sitting on and is the window closing and everybody um, – you know, stock up on your canned goods and toilet paper because it's going to be a long winter. Uh, Jonah, I, I guess I want to just get into it in, in however vague of a sense we want to do, if we want to talk about it from a journalism standpoint. But the information that is out there has been all over the place. And I think in today's media landscape, it is more and more difficult for audiences, namely fans, to figure out what's real, what's not. And then I think there's a also um, some responsibility on the consumer's standpoint to, to try to be as discerning as you can be instead of just trying to read the things that validate your belief. For instance, 
Mike Lombardi says that Sean McDermott took away Leslie Frazier's play calling duties for 13 seconds. I tweet out that I had a discussion with Sean McDermott at the combine in which he said only during that brief time in 2018, did he take away Leslie Frazier's play calling duties and every uh, Leslie called every play other than that. Um, and then people are saying, well, Sean McDermott's lying because they want to believe that Sean McDermott's no good. They don't, or maybe he is lying. I don't know. But the, anyways, the way people are consuming the information, the way the information is being produced, it's been a frustrating off season. And here we go, uh, entering this vacuum, uh, where nothing's going to be learned or probably not much of anything over the next six weeks. Jonah, I don't know what what your take is on these last few days. You were out there at Bill's uh, mini camp. Uh, you were covering the news conferences. Um, what's where do we start? Well, I, I think I want to start with something that Josh Allen said on Tuesday, the first day of the mandatory mini camp, when Stefan Diggs was not there for that first practice. Um, as confusing as some of the things are, contradictory as you know the statements we got out of Allen McDermott even Von Miller throughout the week I think Josh Allen crystallized one thing at one point when he said the quote is here I think it is an organization maybe we're not communicating the right way and communication has been a theme going back to 13 seconds it was a I think Sean McDermott had said that was the breakdown in communication he wouldn't get into the details of it but that was what happened at the end of that game a uh, breakdown in communication I think the Matt Areza situation last um, summer, last training camp, maybe things ended up properly, but as that was working its way out, there were some problematic communications early on in that process and throughout that process, and maybe even outside of Buffalo, that's still happening with that case. And here with the Stefan Diggs situation and Josh Allen and whatever may or may not be going on behind the scenes with the Bills, uh, Josh Allen has said that the communication between players and between the organization and players has been strained at times from the end of last season into this off season. And I would argue, or I, I think it's pretty obvious that the communication from this team to its fans is not always where it needs to be in a lot of different ways. And I think that it opens the door for speculation and wonder and following hunches uh, when the powers that be and, and the principal figures aren't, saying what the truth is and putting out the false narratives and putting out the true narratives. Um, and well, I get letting, it. letting these false narratives run wild because the belief, and it's not, it makes sense. There's a logic to it to say, that's not our fault. That didn't come from us. So they just let it go. And that what it does though, that hurts the team because it creates confusion and, and narratives and people try to get, yeah, there are things that should be nipped in the bud that haven't been. Um, again, I guess, but I think that's a great point. I think that we're hearing from everybody admissions that within the building, the communication hasn't been great, but as you say, to underscore it, the communication from one bill's drive out to the world, um, has not been, uh, flawless. Uh, in fact, it's been downright poor, uh, in many cases. Yeah. And I think Stefan Diggs as a player of his prominence in the NFL with the contract that he makes, the salary that he makes, his popularity, his endorsement potential, the way he's able to get onto magazine covers and be a celebrity athlete because he is a successful and popular football player and the way that, uh, you know, financial ecosystem is fueled by fan consumption and television viewership and all of that stuff. I think any player in any sport in that position owes it to the fans and the even the media in some ways, not us personally, but the media ecosystem around that to if you're not, if you missed the entire voluntary program and you kind of held in or didn't attend one of the practices in the mandatory mini camp to come out and give some sort of explanation why or express your unhappiness and uh, not force the fans to wonder and speculate and create false narratives in their own heads. And I think the Bills, I understand that maybe the details of it could embarrass certain members of the Bills and they're trying to protect people or trying to just protect the team's image overall by not divulging the details. But what that does is it opens the door for more speculation and more wonder and maybe makes things worse in the long run. So without knowing exactly what 
Stefan Diggs is mad about. I do presume that it's maybe not as bad as what some of the rumors are and that it might be better for all involved if people did just put their cards on the table and kind of tell the world and tell the fans and tell the media and talk to each other a little bit. Because if the behind the scenes communication is broken down, maybe just sitting out there and, and pouring your heart out in a micro and in a microphone will allow that to be put to bed. And then going back to 13 seconds, I do wonder if, if people had talked about that and acknowledged the mistakes or acknowledged what happened in the moment or in the immediate aftermath back then, if it wouldn't still be bubbling up reasons why that were, you know, problems that we didn't know about two, almost two years later now. All great points. Um, I think that it's also the, the media industry uh, as it is today, aggregation, for instance, which is both lazy and dangerous. You have a lot of situations where somebody who is not in the building or an outlet that wants to pounce on the Stefan Diggs story, whether they're based in California or New York or whatever, there, there are whole um, businesses that are based on aggregating what's going on around the sports world and especially the National Football League. And if Stefan Diggs is not practicing at mandatory minicamp and the head coach is very concerned, you then have people uh, who want to turn around 500 words, not only about what's going on, but then they want to layer their take on top of it because just pushing on a headline doesn't get people to click on your site. You need to have a take. Now, of course, that's out of the bill's control to a large extent what somebody is going to have an opinion on, but they don't have zero control over that because you don't have Sean McDermott say very concerned. Every The wheels practically fell off that story throughout the course of the day. There's a number of things that the bills could have done uh, to at least try to break even uh, on that particular day, have Sean McDermott come back out again and clarify it that day rather than have it uh, be dominant in the 24 hours uh, that it took for him to get back uh, behind a microphone and, 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 and try to explain himself, which didn't ring true because it did take so long for him to do it. Um, but the aggregation part of it, it's hard to have an opinion and people keep asking me, what do I think about the digs thing? I don't know because I don't know what the reason is. It could be juvenile it could be incredibly stupid. It could be something really profound. I don't know if there's anyone to blame at all. Uh, I don't. Maybe it's an innocent misunderstanding. I don't know. Uh, I've tried to find out. I have sources who do know, sources who I can text directly and not have to go through uh, an intermediary or a gatekeeper. And everybody is tight-lipped about it. I and again that it's an assumption or a present like if it must, it's clearly something that they don't want out there. Um, for what reason? Maybe like you say, it's embarrassing. Maybe it's a personal thing that it's nobody's business. Uh, you know, and I'm saying a, a family thing or a medical thing. I mean, we don't know. Um, and so that's why I can't have an opinion on it. I'm not that type of person who's going to have a hot take on whether Stefan Diggs should have been practicing on Tuesday. Um, but I can tell you, I can have a hot take as somebody who's done this for three decades uh, and pays attention to the uh, the science of communications, for lack of a better phrase, um, how this could have been handled way differently. Uh, and it was just self-inflicted wound after self-inflicted wound, starting with Sean McDermott saying very concerned. Um, he's been an NFL head coach for seven years now. He's, you know, this... He knows what he's saying up there. I mean, did he get caught with his, uh, you know, with a slip? Did he fumble? I don't know. But I mean, he, he's he got to know how these types of stories are going to play about somebody like Stefan Diggs. And if he doesn't, then shame on him and the Buffalo Bills. But then for the Buffalo Bills Twitter account to send out almost like it's breaking news, Stefan Diggs is not uh, practicing. Sean McDermott's very concerned. The photo could have been anything. It could have been a Bill's helmet. It could have been a picture of the stadium. It could have been a picture of Stefan Diggs catching a football. But they specifically chose a photo in which Sean, in which Stefan Diggs looked like he's got a bit of an attitude. Uh, it makes sure that it shows this, the captain C on his jersey. And it was presented as kind of as though the Bill, not even kind of. I mean, the present you the way you whether it's not what the Bills inferred, but you deduce from something like that is, man, the Bills are pissed. Um, 
And this is a big deal. The Bills made it a big deal. When Sean McDermott could have said, if it were true that it was excused, which is what he said Wednesday, then he should have said that on Tuesday and said, it's excused. There would have been a follow-up question about, well, why? Is it is he injured? Wow. Uh, and Sean McDermott would have said, no, it's excused. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, if you know, you can ask Stefan about it, it's going to be up to him. If he wants to talk about it, it's it's up to him. And um, that's that. And then the next question would have been, well, how's Von Miller looking uh, with his knee? Uh, how's Josh with this? Or what do you, you know, uh, uh, people would have gone down their list of stories. They would have moved on. Stefan Diggs, excused abstinence, shrug. Um, yeah, maybe it's something to monitor, but it certainly isn't going to dominate the NFL news cycle for the next 48 hours. And now we have a month and a half with no answers in which people are going to be wondering. And you know, if they hadn't already, the cameras are immediately going to be focused on Stefan Diggs. Anytime there's a problem with the Bills offense during the upcoming season, what's Stefan Diggs doing over there? Is he yelling at Josh Allen? Is he sulking? Uh, does he look like he's still in the game? Does it look like he's like he's pumped up and he's encouraging his teammates? This is going to be an ongoing story now because it has been stamped as Stefan Diggs maybe is that guy that we thought he was in Minnesota. And he'd gone a a, a long ways in rehabilitating that image from when he left the Vikings to being a totally different guy or known as a totally different guy. And now everybody's left to wonder again. So that is the danger again, uh, to use that word. I think it is dangerous the way people consume their media and the way media is produced uh, in trying to figure out what is accurate, inaccurate, disingenuous, um, all kinds of things are going to be said and written about the bills, uh, in the coming months with an eye on, is it time for a change? And the bills did themselves a lot of harm, self-inflicted harm this week in giving ammunition to people to be, or not ammunition, but reason to be on red alert that there are problems at one bills drive and people are just going to be waiting for something to happen, uh, a, a two-game, three-game losing streak, the offense hits a little bit of a, a lull, uh, Stefan Diggs is upset again, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, I, I, yeah, it's – it's uh, and I think us, we as journalists, we need to be careful and diligent in making sure we're not getting too much into hot takery. Well, I have a few reactions there. I think – you mentioned this being a self-inflicted wound by the Bills. I would say it's a Stefan Diggs-inflicted wound that the Bills have maybe not healed properly because I think this all starts with Stefan Diggs blowing up on the sideline and getting caught by television cameras. And then Stefan Diggs... Multiple times, not multiple, just once, multiple well, times. Is, right. Yeah. But I'm saying that this starts with the Cincinnati game. It starts with that televised, you know contention that he has with somebody that it looks like Josh Allen, but we don't know what he was saying, but talking to Josh Allen, then he bolts out of the locker room. So Diggs doesn't talk after the game, doesn't give any explanation or insight as to why he was upset. Some tweets where he did maybe hint at it, but didn't really make himself totally clear. Ha didn't speak on locker cleanout day. Hasn't really given a local interview. He did talk at radio row and reference a few things, but hasn't really, satisfied the curiosity and answer the questions that most Bills fans and especially the media have about this situation. Then we're all hearing different rumors or trying to read the tea leaves. And Stefan Diggs is a player who opens himself up to having his tweets interpreted because of what happened with him in the Minnesota Vikings and all the different tweets that he had there and how those were reacted to. And then when he gets traded to the Bills, he kind of wink, wink, tells everybody, hey, everything that you thought um, I was saying in those tweets, you know, there's truth in all rumors. So there is a pattern of, you know, trying to read between the lines of what Stefan Diggs puts on social media. So I think it's very fair and normal that fans and media are doing that again in the absence of Stefan Diggs answering questions or writing in the player's journal or whatever he's going to do to kind of tell us what's going on. And all of that then coming into, I mean, Stefan Diggs is the second or third most prominent and I don't know if he's the second or third best player on the team, but he's the second or third biggest star on the Buffalo bills. And that makes him, you know, one of the biggest stars in the NFL and one of the biggest stars in sports. 
And when a player like that doesn't come to any of the voluntary practices and has this holdout type situation with the mandatory practice, that is a big deal. And the Bills have to address that. And if Stefan Diggs isn't addressing it, then other players on the Bills and people in the Bills organization are left to speak for him or speak for the organization. And just to kind of maybe uh, clarify or kind of walk through McDermott's press conference on Tuesday. So McDermott comes in, doesn't give an opening statement, jumps right into questions. I think everybody knows it's in the air that this is the story of the day. Is Stefan Diggs here or not? That's the first question. Uh, Stefan Diggs says, or I mean, Sean McDermott says he's not here. The follow-up is, are you concerned? So he was asked, are you concerned? So the, the answer there is yes or no. And he said he's very concerned. And I believe that was a moment of honesty from Sean McDermott, even if it did maybe come back to bite the bills that he said that. I, I would believe that Sean McDermott said he's very concerned because on some level he is very concerned. Now, they would have been better served to all be on the same page and maybe Sean McDermott comes out with a statement at the beginning of the news conference and then – I don't like when they do that, but they say no more follow-up questions or this is what all I'm going to say on the subject. Sean McDermott did do a little bit of that on Tuesday because I think if there was a little bit more back and forth, maybe Sean McDermott would have then indicated, oh, wait, Stefan actually was here yesterday and here this morning. He's not going to practice. All the things he said on Wednesday maybe would have been said on Tuesday if there was more of a back and forth in that press conference. But this is kind of how the sausage is made, and you've been in a lot of these press conferences where things get said one day and then another day it has to come back and kind of elaborate on it. But, you know, I, I think it's it's bad for the Bills on two fronts. One, that Stefan Diggs is, we believe, unhappy with something and wasn't participating because of that unhappiness. And it's also bad that they didn't really have all their ducks in the row and their message straight because that... The Bills also put out bad information to the media during practice when they started getting back to the national media and then eventually talk to the bill, the people who were there covering on Tuesday that he left the building. Right. I mean, wasn't that part of the statement that he was there this morning and then he left before practice. And then even that was McDermott pushed back. He corrected that on Wednesday. Right. There was kind of an evolution, I think, of what that explanation was, but I don't know if it was the bills putting out bad information. I think it was the bills trying to not put out, all of the information and as it started to trickle out they kind of had to double back and clarify things when i think the bills overall wanted this to be a one-sentence story stefan diggs is not here because x period that's it but it became clear that there were a few more Their social media people didn't help them out with that well we could talk about that why that wasn't better coordinated but Another or maybe it was right. purposeful. I, I, I mean, I might. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with how that works. I mean, well, I'm not saying that it went through a. Maybe it wasn't necessarily approved by a manager, but if you work for the Buffalo Bills in their communications and their social media or whatever, you know what's expected. You know what they like, and because you've heard about it. I mean, we've heard, they they suspended Chris Brown. They suspended their own guy uh, a couple of years ago for reporting the wrong stuff they're constantly in in meetings about all right we don't that's not what we do here uh we don't do that again i mean that was that seemed to be like a, a either a rookie mistake or it was approved by the team either way it was it hurt them it was bad for it was bad for the entire story that day because it, it helped it. it it gave it a an extra thrust out there that the bills um uh, apparently as an organization, because it has the logo right there and whatever Sean McDermott, Sean McDermott, very concerned, Stefan Diggs not practicing. Holy shit. Well, about the only thing that was missing from that tweet in all capitals. Holy shit. Yes, but I haven't seen or heard any indication that the Bills football side was unhappy with anything that the social media staff or the communication side did. No, I'm not, I'm not right, saying no, that either. Well, I just think from our standpoint, it, it was a mistake. Yeah, if maybe the maybe well, again, maybe they said, yeah, absolutely. Let's skewer him. Let's. I mean, I'm again. I, I started off this thing by saying I'm not going to speculate, but there's a lot of different reasons about how that tweet could have gotten out, both innocent or nefarious. Uh, but all the reasons that you can come up with, they would be a bad. It would be a bad reason. It would be a mistake. Right. That tweet should that, not have gone out. Well, sure. 
looking back on it, the way it was, the way the message was received and presented, you or I could say that. But I wonder if there maybe was a little bit more coordination and being on the same page because it did happen and none of the tweets got deleted and we haven't heard or seen any rumblings that. Well, at this point, deleting it would make it worse. Well, right. But I and, and I would I assume you don't have any reason to believe that anybody on the bills was unhappy with that tweet or how that was presented by Bill's internal communication. So maybe there was some intentionality to it, that this is what Sean McDermott said in the press conference, and this is the message that we're going to push out with his face on it in this way. That could have been strategic the way that was. And if maybe that was a mistake to do it that way, I don't know that it means that, you know, there was a breakdown of communication or that the different departments didn't know what the other department was doing. I also, from our perspective, kind of like the messiness of this. I think there's a little bit more honesty and genuine expression of thoughts and feelings by the fact that it's a little confusing and we don't really know, are you concerned or are you not concerned? Because I think if everybody just sat down at the podium with a prepared statement that had talking points that, you know, the coach and the quarterback and and every player on the team is saying the exact same thing, I think that's maybe a bit more dishonest and less interesting than what's going on. And maybe it's frustrating to us as journalists if we can't get to the definitive truth of the matter and the bottom of the story to write it. But I also think as, you know, as a fan and and as a media person and just watching, I I just find it more compelling uh, to kind of see these rough edges than it would be if it was just. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's what, that's what our podcast has been so far since we hit the record button, right? It's this, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's a worthwhile topic, but from a communication standpoint, uh, and a journalism standpoint, maybe even more so than what's going out, truly going on with Stefan Diggs and what's truly going on with Josh Allen and what what Von Miller truly thinks about things and doesn't just say because he wants to pander to Bills fans. I mean, there's yeah, I mean, a lot of it just comes off as, as bullshit and I don't care. Um, and that's what and thankfully, thankfully, I work for a company and have a an editor who understands that. Hey, I don't, I'm not going to have a Stefan Diggs column today because I don't know what's going on. And that editor says, Oh, good. All right. Well, keep working it, you know, keep working your sources. And when you feel like you have something solid and you want to go with, then then go with it. But there are other people in journalism who don't have that. They have a boss that says we need Stefan Diggs content today. Uh, Jump on this shit and turn around something uh, that's going to get people talking. Uh, and that's when you start guessing and pulling at threads and leaping to conclusions and uh, and and you and it gets to be really again you use the word messy that's kind of makes it messier. It's like getting in the mud and stomping around in it and splashing the mud all over the place and and getting everything messed up. Um, so I think it's hell. I personally I think it's healthy to stand back and let things play out rather than diving in and and trying to make heads or tails of a situation when we don't know all the information. Yes. And conversations that we've had, you know, off the air before this podcast, we disagreed a little bit. I think that there, there is a distinction and maybe a little bit of a gray area between, you know, what we can write and report as fact and know to be the definitive truth of this matter. And then the category of, you know, informed commentary and, and, this specific to this Buffalo local market, there's a lot less of a strong columnist and a thought leader that there used to be. I think there were several times this past week where I really thought, yeah, I really wish, you know, Bucky Gleason was out here to write this column and put it all in perspective or or Jerry Sullivan being another person that could have done that. And and different people over the years that would have covered this minicamp differently than any of the coverage that I think we saw. And, trying to make this point in the in the most proper way but while i agree with you that we can't write and report anything as fact until we know things as fact i do think there's a space for some uh, informed speculation from the people who have covered the team for a long time or are close to people around the team and maybe you don't know exactly what's happening but you're saying hey this theory i keep hearing from people who kind of know what they're talking about and being able to put that a little bit into the universe as this is the prevailing theory or these are 
the what's believed to maybe be the issue. But you're right. It is a very slippery slope, and very quickly it gets to just guessing based off tweets or just fans wanting something to be true and then looking for the confirmation bias and the hints that they're looking for to make that true. And so I don't know. I'm a little confused myself because we have these conversations and I'm 100% in agreement with you about DeAndre Hopkins and Odell Beckham Jr. and trying to, you know, parse tweets and things you see on the Internet and and turn that into predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Between I think there's a chatter below the surface that hasn't been reported about that various people that cover this team, I think, are pretty close to figuring out why Stefan Diggs has been away from the Bills for a period of time, but have not been able to get that well-placed source to actually tell us this is exactly what's happening. And this is, I guess, because of where my position and the fact that I've done pretty good work over the years and um, I am connected on this particular story. I'm about as connected as you can be from somebody who might want to tell me what's going on and I'm still not being told what's going on. So again, I have a I'm satisfied that I'm doing the work Um, and I don't know. Now, if I were the type of reporter, maybe I'm new to the beat uh, or I don't want to say new to the beat, but let's say I just started covering the NFL like uh, in 2007 uh, when I went down to the Palm Beach Post to cover the Miami Dolphins and this were happening on the Dolphins beat. I might feel pressure to come up with something because I don't have those sources at the time, or I know that I'm not going to get my text returned by the agent or the general manager or the executive or the, the marketing person or, you know, whomever, or, or Stefan Diggs himself. Um, so therefore, I feel the urge to maybe reach a little bit because I'm not going to, I don't have that access. Well, I do have that access. And my inability to come up with something, and I'm com- so comfortable enough that I'm telling Anybody who's listening or watching this podcast, I don't know. And I've been trying to find out and I don't know. I, and I'm, that doesn't make me a failure as a reporter. Um, th- this might be one I don't get. And maybe it was one I was never going to get in terms of the inside info. But I know that I can get it. It's possible for me to get it. Therefore, I'm going to wait until I find out. You know what I mean? I mean, that, I, that was a long rambling bit. But yeah, I think that. So I do think that there are people here in this market who have theories that are educated or semi-educated. Um, I'm willing to raise my hand and say, I'm not one of them. Um, I've heard something. The only thing that I've been told by a source I trust is that it doesn't have to do with Ken Dorsey. That's about the only thing I've been able to get. I, I don't know what it is, but that's what I've been told it is not. Um other than that, I would be totally guessing, and it's hard for me to have an opinion if I don't know who the, if I don't know what the problem is. And I think it it's it becomes frustrating for me because the fans are so frustrated because they want and are demanding either the information or they want to be told what should we think about this. They 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 maybe even leap past that and say, how do we what's the analysis? What's going to happen? How do we spin this forward? How's this going to affect the season? How's this going to affect the Bills offense? I don't know because I don't even know what the fucking problem is. So if you don't know that, you can't even guess how it's going to impact the offense. Um, Don't know. So that's where I stand on it. Yeah, Um, I, I do think, though, you know, we talked about how kind of just following your hunches or reading the tea leaves can lead you down the wrong road and maybe lie to you. But sometimes direct sources can lie to you. And sometimes even people will say mistruths at on the record at press conferences because this isn't testifying on the stand. And sometimes it's spinning a topic or trying to throw a red herring out there and say, you know, something that is a little bit true but disguises another element of the truth. And while we always want the direct sources and we want to be as close to the situation as we can with our reporting, sometimes there is some value in indirect sourcing. And I've experienced this a lot more with, you know, kind of the local colleges and the local high schools, but there might be a 
a coach or a person who, if I ask them directly, hey, are you taking this job or I heard this or that, they won't want me to know. They either won't respond or won't or deny what's going on. But you kind of have another friend of that coach or another coach who's being told these things because they're not a reporter. And then that person tells me and you're getting the real information uh, in a roundabout way. And I think there's a little bit of that going on here with the Stefan Diggs situation. And even though that might prevent any of us from having the real report, I think there's some credence to some of what you hear, but you have to be skilled and experienced and have the right instincts as a journalist to ferret through the truth and the partial truths and kind of know when you know the facts and you can report it. And as you're doing a very good job of right now, knowing when you don't know what the truth is and you're not sure and you're not ready to give an informed opinion yet because you're still getting, you know, mixed reads from your different sources. So I think right. that, and that's, that's what's going on here. There's a lot of different theories and different speculation and different wonderment because sometimes Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes you know it's about the contractor. Sometimes it's just very clear what's going on. And in this case with Stefan Diggs, it's not very clear. But I do think one of the prevailing theories is true. I, I don't know exactly which one it is, but I don't think it's something completely from Mars that nobody would ever think of. I think. I well, think what added to the there, confusion, adding to the confusion on Tuesday was, uh, yeah, we're we're hearing. I, I don't want to repeat them. I mean, I guess we can. I mean, they're rumors, but these prevailing thoughts, um, a lot of them, I say that's football related. And Josh Allen specifically said it's not football related. And I hear a bunch of stuff and I'm like, that's football, you know, whether it's a team. And then he came back later and said it has something to do with being a teammate or whatever. Well, isn't that freaking football? I mean, what do you mean teammate? I mean, uh, and then his agent was telling people it's not contract related. Um, that doesn't leave much room. If it's not football related and it's not contract related, um, that eliminates a lot of these rumors that we've been hearing. Um, Except, I mean, I don't know. Do we, I, I think I understand what Josh meant by that. I don't know. What, what, what do you think? I, don't, I mean, I think that I think that goes back to his communication statement. I think that the issues began with being something that's football related. And I think that's still lingering. But I think when Josh Allen said the things that they're talking about are not football related, I think that has to do with the lack of communication between Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs at various points. And I don't know the exact details of that, but I believe that is what Josh Allen was the point he was trying to make. Yeah. He accepted some, he accepted partial blame and all kinds of stuff, but. Because obviously there's something there. Josh Allen didn't sit there and say, you guys are barking up the wrong tree. Stephon Diggs is happy as a clam and there's no issues. They did say there's something. They would not divulge what the details are, but obviously there are issues. Yeah, I, I think that Josh Allen's news conference on Tuesday allowed whatever opinion you have or whatever inkling you have about Stephon Diggs' situation, even if it's polar, polar opposite. 180 degrees opposite um, what you can pull out comments that Josh Allen made on Tuesday and say, see, this proves it because he was all over the place. Right. Yes. And so you could say the same thing about Stefan Diggs tweets because they are so vague and opaque that anything that you want to believe about this situation, you can find a tweet or a social media post or an animated GIF or whatever Float your boat to support, you know, what, what you think is going on here. Uh, Jack Eichel won the Stanley cup. Uh, he did not win the con Smythe, but uh, I think it's funny. And we, I, we talked about it on the podcast last week. Uh, didn't we about me moving away from Las Vegas because it was never going to be a major league city uh, back in late 1999, early 2000. I left Las Vegas, moved to Buffalo because I wanted to work in a big league town. And uh, at that time, it was not only unfathomable, unfathomable, it was impossible. The leagues were coming out and flatly saying we will never be in Las Vegas. Uh, the gambling issue was just too controversial. Uh, the, no, nobody was ever going to come to Vegas. Now here they're on the verge of getting their third major league franchise, the fourth major league uh, uh, 
a biggie. Uh, the NBA has long had a strong foothold in Las Vegas. I don't even know if they need a franchise in Las Vegas with as much as they do there with the summer league and the award shows and all-star games and whatever else. But they are uh, going to get one. I mean, that, that hasn't been announced, but that's been very sure. strongly. The arena's reported. already built. I mean, yeah. once the arena's built, I mean, it's just one more tenant. Um, although I do think that the market is going to get stretched in. It is it, it Vegas, although growing, is still you know, not the largest market. In fact, it's one of the smaller major league markets to have four teams. Maybe a stretch. Anyway, that's a different conversation. But it, so I moved to Buffalo in January of 2000 and here it is 23 years later and I've not covered a world championship. Uh, and the town that I left now uh, is a world champion. Uh, Las Vegas uh, is uh home of a Stanley cup winner. And there will be a parade down Las Vegas Boulevard. Jonah, that leads me to the parade you covered on Thursday, the oh. Buffalo Bandits. Um, I mean, National Lacrosse League aside, what was it like to cover a championship parade? Well, real quick, maybe maybe you're covering the wrong sports or maybe you are the jinx. Maybe you being not a big-time reporter yourself is what prevents these teams from being reaching the right. pinnacle and being big time teams, or maybe you should go back to Las Vegas. Maybe that city just wasn't ready for a reporter of your caliber 20 something years ago. And now <laughs> they are, you should make your grand return. Um, yeah. The Buffalo bandits championship parade was a, uh, you know, it was fun to cover and it looked like a lot of fun to be part of it. You know, the players drinking on stage, drinking on top of fire trucks and really reveling in this bandit land culture. Cause I think it was a bit more of, it was a bit more than just celebrating a team that won the league championship. It was a celebration of bandit land and the connection that this team has with its fan base and being a marquee franchise in that league, but having not won the championship in its last three trips to the finals. And it would be a little bit of like if the bills had lost three super bowls and then won the fourth one, obviously it's not of the magnitude of what a bills championship would be, but there was some of that, like, you know, this was a, a moment that Bandits fans and Buffalo sports fans had been waiting a while for, hadn't experienced that championship in 15 years. I don't remember if there was a parade celebration like this the last time the Bandits won. I remember them winning, and I remember it being a festive atmosphere at the arena, but I don't remember this kind of parade type thing. And it was also nice, the synergy that they were able to have with the Bisons and do this on. It was already a pre-planned lacrosse night at the baseball game, and to be able to have this, celebration and parade up Washington street and having about 4,000 people chanting, let's go bandits. And then walk right into the baseball game where that spirit permeated another, you know, minor league, but big sporting venue in this town. And it really felt like a, a moment yesterday's parade kind of felt like almost as big of a deal as the championship game itself was a couple weeks back, even though there were 18,000 people at that game and, and only four at this, but it definitely had the feeling of a memorable Buffalo sports moment. But you also, your mind, and I think the fans' minds, maybe even more than I do, immediately wanders to what's this going to be like if the Sabres win the Stanley Cup or what's this going to be like if the Bills win a Super Bowl? And it would be all of the fun and debauchery that you saw yesterday, I think times 10 for the Sabres and times 20 for the Bills. And the only thing about the Bills, I mentioned this to another reporter that was there is that it'll be, you know, a, a snow squall and, and practically a blizzard when they have that parade in February, if it ever happens. And this was a little bit of rain, but this was a nice June day. And if the Sabres win the Stanley Cup, that'll be on a nice June day. And that'll be another fun atmosphere if and when that ever happens. Times 10 of what, uh, you know, the people that were there yesterday experienced. But for the hardcore lacrosse fans, the hardcore Bandits fans, you could tell that this was a a moment that they've been waiting for and that they really enjoyed being able to celebrate with the team, how accessible some of the players and Coach John Severus are to the fan base and their ability to – the fact that it wasn't 40,000 people, that it was only 4,000 people, the people there were able to kind of work their way up and shake hands or slap hands with the players and the coaches, and they were all able to stand in line and get a picture taken with the NLL Cup and – hang out with the mascot and, and do things like that to where a 50,000 person parade at the Bills or Sabres wins wouldn't allow for that same kind of, you know, the Denver Nuggets parade. I don't think fans were able to shake hands with Nikola Jokic 
as easily as, as they might have been in Buffalo yesterday. Uh, yeah, pretty cool event. I, you know, I was saw the, the footage of it, but uh, and footage can lie, especially if you shoot it in such a way you can make 4,000 people look like seem or feel like 40,000. But uh, it's uh, it sounds like a pretty cool event. Um, on the topic yeah. of championships, Jonah, oh, what? Well, I was gonna say, you could uh, head out to Vegas and cover this Golden Knights parade and then kind of report back on the differences between a, a parade in Vegas and maybe what one might someday experience in Buffalo. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. How, how a parade down Las Vegas Boulevard can be extrapolated into what it's going to be like in Buffalo, right? Yeah, well, you remind me though of a point you made off the air in the last day or two when we were talking that I I, I agree with that you know everybody in Buffalo really wants a championship and, and one before I die that sentiment, but from the outside perspective, Buffalo and Buffalo sports seem to be more compelling and more interesting without a championship. That this strong loyalty and fan base and getting close but never getting over the edge might hurt Buffalo sports fans to experience, but it has been ingrained into the culture of Buffalo sports fandom. And I think that's what, from the global perspective outside of the market, makes Bill's mafia, if you will, so interesting. Yeah, it's uh, the fact that Vegas has won a championship in year six and the Sabres and Bills are still looking uh, adds another feather to that nest that uh, that Buffalo sports fans have to sleep in every night. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's getting a little lonelier uh, as uh, without that championship. But it's compelling. It's that's one of the reasons the Cubs and the Red Sox were so interesting for so long. It's why Cleveland sports, uh, the brother be the Browns or the Guardians. And of course, the Cavs won their championship. But um, it, it, it's uh, it, as a native Clevelander, I can say that the Cavs are a distant third in terms of interest uh, in that town. And uh, it's it's the Guardians slash Browns that are going to need to really make Cleveland feel like a winner if they were ever to win a championship. On that topic, I want to I want to ask you about Depew baseball. And we don't talk a ton about high school sports, but Jonah, it's your wheelhouse uh, because you know these stories so well, and it's just a great, compelling story uh, from Depew High School and their baseball team and their coach. To, uh, give us the background on that. Well, it was. It broke a championship doubt. The Pew Baseball won the Class B state championship. It was the first team championship by any DePew school, and it was the first time a local ever, ever in, in any sport. Wow. Team sport. And it was the first time in 10 years, first time in a decade that a West New York baseball team, a Section 6 baseball team, has won a New York state championship. And it was a compelling story. Because the Depew coach, Dennis Crawley, was very popular in the baseball community in and out of Depew, uh, has been battling ALS for the past two years, I believe, at least more than a year. And, you know, you can see it if you watch the games, how much he's battling that disease and he's on crutches in the dugout and kind of just to see that team rally around him and play for him and give him that experience. Because as Dennis Crowley told, uh, reporters out there in Binghamton after the game. He's not sure if he will coach next year or beyond uh, the next season or two. He doesn't really know what the future holds and being able to experience that championship and go through that with his team and his program where he played, um, I think was a special moment for Depew and by extension, Western New York baseball. And, you know, just kind of a neat story uh, to see how that uh, culminated. Jerry Sullivan wrote about it for West New York Athletics and called it one of those, you know, Hollywood endings. It's too good for Hollywood. You know, it was kind of uh, the scripted storyline and often it doesn't play out that way. And then when it does, you almost kind of can't believe how how perfect the story uh, aligns together. Yeah, that's just uh, it, it kind of slipped through the cracks because everybody and that's the way it is in in most markets uh, and especially in big league markets. Everybody's focused on. What's going on with the NBA Finals, Stanley Cup, the Buffalo Bills, mandatory camp, all this bullshit that we were talking about for the first 40 minutes of this podcast. And uh, sometimes these stories uh, don't get to the fore uh, like they should. So I will I will say it did get I think it got well covered by the Buffalo News. I know there's been times on this podcast where we've maybe lamented or bashed Buffalo News coverage in some ways. But I think the Buffalo News in this 
story and in this context still was there on the scene with a story and nice photos and followed this to few baseball team through their semifinal win took eight hours to complete. It was a long game, a rain delay, and, and it was a, I think an extra innings win and West New York athletics was out there live streaming and doing their coverage. So it, it did get, maybe it flew under the radar in some ways because it didn't happen in Buffalo. It happened in Binghamton but I'll give some kudos to the the outlets that traveled and covered this story and then reported back to us because most of what I know came from those reporters that went and covered the thing live. And I was able to you know catch up on what was happening while I was back here in Buffalo. Kudos, kudos, kudos. Uh, Jonah, anything else in the notebook we want to uh, address before we wrap this up? No, I think we got through it all. I think anything else, you know, might keep us on this this Zoom call, this podcast for much longer. Um, I, 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 maybe real quick, I think because of how much attention has been focused on whether Stefan Diggs was, was at Bill's practice or not in, in the different tentacles of that storyline, um, I think it's been reported, but I think there's been – less attention on how well the Bills have done in this late stage of free agency and signing a player like Leonard Floyd and the additions they made on the defensive line and the offensive line, how they were able to use uh, the money that they didn't spend on Tremaine Edmonds uh, when they were up against the cap and they were able to sign a lot of good players. Some of them signed for minimum contracts. Leonard Floyd's one of those deals where there's void years and he's getting seven to nine million, but he's not counting that much against the cap. The Ed Oliver contract, I think, was well-structured to not hurt the Bills' salary cap this year or next year and then see how that goes in the future. And I think that, you know, maybe there's some reasons to be concerned about things happening at the very top of the Bills' power structure and, and things we talked about at the top of this podcast. But there's a lot to like about the way the Bills were able to add to this roster without much cap flexibility, what Brandon Bean was able to do, some draft picks that looked like, I think, they're going to help right away, at least two or three of them. So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about going into the bill season, even though there's maybe a little bit to be pessimistic about. Yeah, there's turbulence. And then uh, people see what the Miami Dolphins have been doing to improve. Uh, they make big signings. They do big things. The Jets getting Aaron Rodgers, you know, the gap closing between the Bills and the rest of the division. Yeah, I think people are a little concerned i think that the bills are all their their win total is only 10 and a half which seems really low but there's so that means that vegas has a little bit of um trepidation about the bill's success moving forward but uh they're still the best team in the afc east as far as i'm concerned i, I think they're still a super bowl contender um i mean things could happen i mean that something could uh, so, there could be an implosion who knows but um still a lot to like like you say jonah um, and, and I think that the built-in pessimism, the, uh, the, uh, inferiority complex, the always waiting for the other shoe to drop, uh, that is the life of a Buffalo sports fan. People are constantly looking for the flaws. They're looking for the pock marks. They're looking for the, um, the monster waiting around the corner uh, when things uh, seem pretty good. So that's, I think that also fuels into a lot of this stuff with Stefan Diggs and what's going on. People are just, uh, see, this is why we can't have nice things. You know, well, just waiting it, for ba something bad to happen or looking for something bad to happen. And sometimes it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Another storyline that I think was a little bit obscured in the last couple of weeks, even though it was a very big storyline earlier in the spring is DeMar Hamlin's return to the practice field. And he, went from being, you know, cleared to participate, but wasn't really participating to being a full participant by the end of the mini camp. And Sean McDermott had spoke about how he'd gotten an interception in one of the practices where the media wasn't there and how special of a moment that was for the Bills. And I think, I think the Bills realized this themselves, but maybe the fans need to be reminded of in that, those harrowing moments with DeMar Hamlet, how much you kind of realize that, you know, just, having a team and having players to root for and, and appreciating the game for what it is and the health and safety of the players and the entertainment value and that winning the Super Bowl isn't the only reason why these professional sports franchises exist for the fan base and maybe kind of just living in the moment and appreciating what is happening and being a little less worried about what's not happening. Although 
I don't want to bash all the fans because I think some fans have had the proper perspective about Stefan Diggs and aren't really all that concerned or they're only going to be concerned if he's not out there on game day. I've also heard some fans that maybe aren't upset. They are a little bit upset with Stefan Diggs that 89 players were there and he was the 90th guy and he wasn't there on Tuesday and that that's improper leadership. So I, I, this is what happens when it's the off season and you have this kind of 12 month cycle of NFL news, there's going to be reactions, whether they're right or wrong or overheated or not. That's just the name of the game at this point in the NFL calendar. Jonah, thank you. And uh, thanks everyone out there for listening to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK. Please subscribe. Uh, Please rate the podcast, give it a thumbs up or whatever your platform does for a rating system. Uh, Give us a good grade because I think if you've gotten to this point and uh, you stayed with this podcast for the whole thing, you must've enjoyed it. So uh, subscribe, like it and uh, catch you next week. Thank you out there to everyone for being so loyal to us. And uh, have a great weekend. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsource solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400. 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. We'll be right back.